RMT, Andrew Castle with you. Mick Lynch is with me, General Secretary of the RMT, joining us from the uh, picket line at Euston. Another strike today. Mick, good morning to you. Good morning. But, um, let's get some facts straight now. How long, um, how long has this all been going on, Mick? Well, we had the ballot last May, the first ballot. We've been on strike in, on various occasions since June last year. Yeah. I mean, you know, don't, what, what is your level of frustration at this point? What happened, what happened this week to still see you out? Well, we haven't had an improved offer. We've had various uh, versions of an offer, which are very modest, is the best I can say about it. Pay uh, proposals over two years when we haven't had a pay rise for three years. But they, it's what we call a strings attached conditional offer. There are loads, 18, I think, separate items that the train operating companies want us to swallow. And we've done a very thorough consultation with our people. Thousands of members took part in a big conversation about those conditions and they simply can't accept the dilution of the agreements we've made over the decades on the railways and changes to their contracts of employment and working practices that are not acceptable so for our, for our members at the forefront of this are those conditions the money is important obviously in this day and age with the cost of living crisis and the dilution of earnings against inflation but really we need to sort out these conditions they need to back off on the confrontation they've put to our people and then get us a, a pay rise that we can put out to a referendum uh, on a basis that we can deal with. Because there hasn't been a vote yet. I know you are representatives at the RMT, but there's not been a direct vote from, uh, from the members, has there? Well, on the network rail, we're in a second referendum. Uh, we'll get the result of that on Monday. So there's two halves to this, the network rail, which runs the infrastructure of the railway, and the train operating companies, which move the passengers around, obviously. And we haven't had an offer because it breaches red lines. They've put into that offer, for instance, driver-only operation. If you followed the railway over the last five or six years, maybe six or seven years, we can never accept driver-only operation. So it's a foolish step by any negotiator to put into a deal or prospective deal something that you know the other side can never accept as a matter of principle. So that's a silly move, really because it provokes a reaction from our people. They say, well, we don't want to talk about money. There's no point in talking about money if I haven't got a job. So we're in that situation where they're looking to lay off thousands of our people and redeploy them into lower lower paid jobs if they get the opportunity to stay on. So, uh, you know, if you're an ordinary worker working as a guard or a conductor, and they say, well, there is a pay rise on offer, but most of you won't have a job in the future. There's not much point in so, talking about the pay no, no, I, if I, you're not here to collect it. I understand that completely. People are fighting for their jobs. Is there any way, is there, a, is there voluntary redundancy as a possibility? Is there, there's no circumstances, Mick, under which you would accept driver-only operated trains. There's no way that could be formulated over no, a year or two can, years or three years. It's not possible. Know. We cannot accept that. We've fought disputes, and they know that. In on Southwest Rail, on Northern Rail, we've still got a dispute, which we're not, which isn't active at the minute because of everything else. And on Southern, where we fought to a standstill over two or three years, 60 and 70 days of strike action, they know we're not going to accept that. Yeah. So that won't happen. We think that's there to protect the public uh, and the railway. So that's not going to happen. Are there any other elements of modernisation, which I understand was the reason why you said no more um, t talking this week? I was talking to Simon Calder earlier on. I know you speak to him on a regular basis. Were there any elements of modernisation that you <clears throat> that you will accept on behalf of your members and recommend to your members? Yeah, I mean, what they call modernisation is often a, a cover for cuts. They want to cut jobs out and, and cut all the... They're going to close all the ticket offices in Britain. That's in the document. Now, we can deal with changes in retail practices. We understand the apps and the uh, the websites that people use to access their their, their uh, tickets and their fares and all the rest of it. We can deal with that, and we've always dealt with it. We're not riding around on Stevenson's rocket. We've got new trains, new technology. Our people service those trains. They repair them. That was my my own trade on the railways. I worked on the the most highly technical trains that we have on Eurostar. So we've dealt with all that, but we've got to deal with it through agreement, not through imposition, and the the culling of jobs, good jobs, green jobs in our economy that stabilise mm. uh, working class communities, rather than the jobs that exist now in our economy, zero hours, 
uh, and diluted conditions. A lot of people are angry about what's happened in our economy and we're not going to ha let that happen on the railway. So we can deal with new technology, Andrew, and we will deal with it, but through agreement, not through imposition. So you've got Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, describing what he's put on the table, what, what you're talking about, as a best and, and final offer. Do you, do you actually believe that? And just to confirm what that is, Mick, Mick so we've got the right facts in front of us. Uh, it's a wage rise of 5% 2022, 4% uh, this year contingent on modernisation intended to increase efficiency. So that's where, and some of the lowest paid getting uh, p potentially 13%, uh, as I understand it. Are these uh, percentages more or less correct? Yeah, there's an underpin for the lowest paid, which we've we've requested in that in that formula. But the the as I repeat, Andrew, the, it's not all about money. Money's important, but that's not the overriding factor. Uh, our members are resisting this based on um, the conditions that I've described. Yeah. Some of them, 18 separate areas. Yeah. In network rail, we have got that out to a, a referendum at the moment. They've improved the best and final offer. Uh, by adding more money and more earnings to our people, new money. So the train operating companies can do that. The government has approved the offer on Network Rail. Uh, but what Network Rail said to us, we don't have to agree these conditions, these changes, in order to access that money. You can have that agreement uh, and we'll deal with the changes they want to make through the company's normal machinery. Yeah. So, so if, the, if the train operators make a step like that, we may be able to get a, a formula that we can, we can develop. So you're you're out today. Next out thirtieth of this month, and then the first of uh, then the first of April um, uh, as well. And I mean, you know, it's been going on for so long now. Do you still feel resilient? Do you feel that people still feel resilient? I mean, they they you know they're losing money yeah, well, every time they every time they strike. We're, yeah, we're here today in, in the pouring rain. We've I got a young reporter here <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's resilient as well. Fair, so fair play to him. Um, yeah, we're resilient. We're, we'll keep going. Picket lines are out all over the country. We've got an opportunity next week. There's two, two weeks clear without strikes. Uh, I think we're going to be invited in on Tuesday to meet the companies. If they can show a bit of goodwill that, you know, we're seeing around the public sector at the minute, those other deals that people are being given are not conditional. That's one of the key differences. So the nurses, the ambulance workers, the firefighters and others are being given clean deals, as we call them. It's just a money deal. Here's an offer. Do you want to accept it? The RMT is not getting that for some reason because I think they, uh, the government sees us as a particular target for whatever reason they've got. If we can get something different, a different formulation and a different set of attitudes from the government and from their, their agents in the train operating companies, there's an opportunity in the next week or so to develop something and do, I hope that happens. Do you think some of this is personal Mick, because you've made yourself such a, a spokesperson, not just for RMT and, and people in your industry but kind of there's a, there's, a, there's a sense that you represent something a little bit wider in terms of a challenge to the government, do you think some of this is, is, is personal? Well, it's a challenge. I don't like the government, Andrew. I'm going to be frank about that. But it's not up to me to change the government. I can't do that. I get one vote out of whatever it is, 50 million votes or something. And I'll t cast my vote <coughs> at the ballot box. We're not going to bring the government down. We'd like the government to modify what they do in a lot of areas, particularly the railway. But they are the elected government and they have the right to govern. And we've got the right to protest and strike under our traditional laws, which are being clamped down on, as you know. So it's not personal for me. When I meet any minister or any politician, whether they're in Scotland or in the regions or in, in government or in opposition, I'm professional and polite. I think I've got a sense of humour. Any of them that have met me will tell you that if they were, had the, right, you know, the privilege to talk to you privately, that I'm an amenable guy. My job is to try and get a deal for our people. I'm not a poser. I don't bang the table. And I don't just do gesture uh, politics or whatever you want to call it. I'm a negotiator and so are all my officials. So if we can work on that basis, respect each other's positions and each other's mandates, then we, we think, can get a deal going forward. Do you think the 30th and the 1st you'll, you'll be out again? Or, I mean, how optimistic are you? I'm always optimistic. Standing here in the rain, I can't be anything other than optimistic. So oh, not let you go I, I, I'll, be, I'll be working for a deal, Andrew, and hopefully we won't have to take those strikes. That's, yeah. that's my position. All right, Mick. Well, listen, thanks ever so much, and um, thank you to Alan Zazinski, our reporter, who is holding the microphone down there at Euston. That is Mick Lynch, General Secretary of the RMT, just coming up to uh, 8 o'clock.